Good morning. If you would open your Bibles, please, to Jeremiah chapter 3. The title of this morning's message is The Call to Return. It seems like this call, it goes out quite a bit from the Lord. He keeps calling and calling, come back, come back. Why are you running? Why are you heading away when I want you to return? And in choosing this morning's title for the message, I thought it sounds a lot like where we have been before in the studies, and it's because God desires that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And he will call, and he will call, and he will call. And because we have free will, some will not come back. They simply choose to continue to run in the opposite direction. In our previous studies in the book of Jeremiah, the last one in particular was entitled Broken Cisterns. Do you remember that? It was God calling out to the people of Israel and to the people of Judah and saying, why, why are you doing what you're doing? Why have you forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and chosen rather than a fountain which has no end? You've chosen to store water in cisterns that cannot hold water. And what is that, what does that mean to the life of somebody that's out there in the wilderness? If you have no water, what does that mean? You have no life. You're not going to last very long that way. And God's question to them, he says, what did I do? What did I do that caused you to turn from me and run after the gods of the nations around you. He said, those nations, they don't abandon their gods. They're very faithful to their gods, and their gods are just idols. They're false. They, they provide nothing for their people. But you, my people, choose to leave me, the one true living God, and forsake me to follow after gods that cannot hear, cannot see, cannot answer, cannot do anything. The devotion this morning was right where those people were at that time. And it's not unique to the, those people or that time. It, it continues on and has always been a part of the world's struggle to seek after false gods, idols that cannot answer prayers. We are a people who know that our God has an ear to hear. He hears every prayer that, that we pray. Every time we call out to him, he hears. Every time we fall on our faces, he sees, he knows. Our shortcoming is that we think that because he doesn't answer the way that we think that he should answer, or in the timing that we think that he should answer, that he's not listening. And that is not true. He hears every single word. He knows exactly what we think. He knows how many breaths we are going to take in the next 60 seconds. Do you know that? Do you know how many breaths you're going to take in the next 60 seconds? I have no idea. And it's probably all different for all of us. We breathe at different rates. But he knows every breath you take. He knows your blood pressure. He knows how many times your heart is going to beat different from mine. He knows every thought that you're thinking right now. He knows everything about us. Why would you forsake a God who knows all these things and yet loves us for a God who has nothing? A God of stone, a God carved out of a tree. Remember when we were reading through Isaiah, Isaiah said, why would you worship a God that you cut up out of the forest and with part of it you make your furniture, with part of it you make the fire that's in your fireplace, and with part of it you make an idol that you worship? Same tree, what profit is there in that? And Jeremiah is recording here. These are hard chapters, and I looked at some of the titles that some of the other pastors gave to these two chapters, two and three. It said, a message I don't want to give. A message that's hard to preach. It is, it, they are hard chapters, but they're necessary. 
That's why God put them in there. If he didn't mean it, he wouldn't have given it to us. And in chapter 3, he's moving from this place of uh, speaking about what he's done to a call to them and what they need to do and what anybody who is not walking closely with the Lord needs to do. There's a call to return. The nation itself that he is speaking to specifically through Jeremiah is the nation of Judah, the southern two tribes, the southern two peoples, because the northern tribe of Israel has already gone into captivity and has been there for a hundred years. And, Jesus, and, and the Lord is going to speak to them concerning, you saw what happened in the northern ten tribes, the northern kingdom of Israel. How is it you didn't learn from that? Can any of us in here say that any example, and every example that I have seen before me, I learned from and then uh, did not repeat the mistakes that those other people made? Everybody makes mistakes and, a, and everybody has examples before us and says, you know, I saw that happen in this person, and yet I did it too. And I went down that road. And it will happen probably again. Because we are a people who, we're, we're sheep, right? Sheep are numbered amongst the least intelligent of all animals on the face of the earth. They're not bright. They're so lame that if one goes off the edge of a cliff, all of them are going, and they go off the cliff too. They fall right off the cliff. And they say the only ones that survive are the ones that fall off last. And why is that? Because they're hitting a bunch of cush, a bunch of wool that's already gone down there. We're not, we can be very, we can be very um, disobedient. We can be all kinds of things because we don't understand the full depth of God. He is beyond our ability to understand, but he says, I'm not asking you to understand me. I'm just asking you to trust me, to have faith in me. And if I'm giving to you this warning, then you should heed it, right? So one of the things that Rachel, and I've mentioned this before, what she does is with her, with her boys is she will say to them before they find themselves in a bad way, she'll say, take the warning before the discipline. You know how often they take the warning? You know, they, end up, they end up in the discipline side of all the, It's just the way that it is. Um, but the, the idea is that eventually they will get to that place as they grow, as she trains them up, uh, to understand it's best to take the warning because I don't want the re, uh, repercussions of the discipline. It's just not desired. And this is what the Lord is saying to the people of Judah. In verse 1, he says, They say if a man divorces his wife, and she goes from him and becomes another man's, may he return to her again? Would not that land be greatly polluted? But you've played the harlot with many lovers. You have uh, yet returned to me, says the Lord. The Lord is saying, this is a relationship that, that we have, God to his people. And you've played the harlot, and yet I'm, gonna, I'm calling you to come back into that relationship with me. There are um, examples that the Lord gives in Scripture regarding those people who have gone astray, all you know, sheep. And there, it's one that comes to mind very quickly is the prodigal son, correct? Has a relationship with his father and with his brother and then goes to his father and says, um, you know, give me what is coming to me now and I'm going to head out. And he does. The father gives it to the son, the son heads out and he squanders it, right? On bad living, bad choices and finds himself in that place of understanding that even the servants in his father's house live better than where he is now, uh, feeding at the pig trough. You ever seen pig trough? Uh, what, what's inside of it? Not pleasant. And he's looking down in there and he said, my, my father's servants, are, they, they are doing better than me here and I'm going home. And 
the father receives him as he returns home. The son had headed out. Father, give me the goods. He, the son returns. Make me a servant in your house. I'm not worthy to be called your son anymore. I just want to, I'll serve in your house. And the father says, you know, that's not the way this is going to be. I'm going to receive you as my son. Has a feast because he said, you were dead. You're now alive. You were lost and you're now found. And that's, that's, a, that's a great uh, illustration of God's love for the son who has headed out, who's backslidden. You're going to see in this chapter a lot about backsliders. What's a backslider? It doesn't mean that you're sliding on your back. It means that you were at one time at this point in your relationship with the Lord and you have slid from that place backwards. You're not moving forwards. You're not growing closer to him. You're going the other direction. You're sliding backwards. You're a backslider. And so the, in speaking about the son, the prodigal son is a wonderful illustration of that and the love of a father for his son. And there is, you know, you grow up a certain way, you understand from a child's perspective what it means to love your parent. And then uh, from a parent's perspective, you learn what it means to love your child. Those relationships are different than the relationship we have with our spouse, aren't they? Because when we are joined together with our spouse, our two souls become entwined together. And, and so as we go through this third chapter, the Lord's saying, this isn't the relationship. I'm not talking about the father to child. I'm talking about what it's like to have your wife run off and become a harlot. And then, because God is gracious, he said, but I want you back. I want you to come back. Now, that's grace. That's grace beyond what we really understand, but that's God's grace, and, there's, uh, and that's what he's saying here. He's saying this is not like the prodigal son. This is like a wife who's been unfaithful, not once, but many times, with many and he says, that's what it's like for me as God to watch you go after these other gods. Not just one other God, but many. And then to become like the nations, in fact, worse than the nations around you. So he says in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 1, return to me. Lift up your eyes to the desolate heights and see where you have not lain with them, with men. By the road you sat for them like an Arabian in the wilderness and you have polluted the land with your harlotries and your wickedness. Therefore, the showers have been withheld. And there's been no latter rain. You had a harlot's forehead. You refused to be ashamed. Will you not from this time, cry to me, my father, you, have, you are the guide of my youth. Will he remain angry forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, you have spoken and done evil things as you were able. The Lord said also to me, that is Jeremiah, that in the days of Josiah the king, have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She's gone up on every high mountain, and on every green tree, and there played the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, return to me. But she did not return, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. She's, the Lord is saying, you saw what happened in the northern kingdom. You saw them begin to spiral down. You saw me call out to them. You saw their betrayal to me. They've gone after these other gods. And then you saw the discipline. At this point, they've been carried away by the Assyrians. The, the northern kingdom of Israel is in, in a possession of Assyria. And you saw the desolation that came to that northern kingdom because of their treachery, because they turned from me and began to follow these other gods, and needed to be disciplined. And that discipline. Did you use timeouts as a means of disciplining your children? 
or were you a, a victim of being timed out as a, as a means of discipline? Um, really, our kids were not, they didn't put us in a position where we had to do a lot, whole lot of that. But, ooh, timeouts were kind of ugly. They hated it. In particular, um, you know, Joshua, he, I remember his first time out hearing the backside of that door. He was kicking that door. He was, it was not a good thing. But you know what happened as a result of it? He learned. He said, I don't want that. He said, I, I, I don't want that at all. And, uh, and that, that was a wonderful thing because we didn't have to do it a whole lot. It wasn't this constant repeating and, and without learning. On top of that, his sister said, I don't want that either. And they learned from his mistakes. They, Rachel and Danielle never had time out. Um, that's not to say that they didn't have training. <laughs> but it was never necessary for time out because they just watched that and they said, I don't want that. That's not, that's not for me. Judah saw... They heard the warnings. They, they saw what was going on up north. And they saw the discipline that came as a result of the fact that Israel did not heed the warnings. And the Lord says in verse 8, Then I saw that for all of the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. So Judah, the southern kingdom, saw what happened, saw the repercussions, saw the discipline, saw the timeout, and it says they didn't, they didn't learn from it. And they committed the exact same thing, and God is going to hold them even more accountable because they saw what was going on, they saw the fruit of that, and still they rebelled. So it came to pass through the casual harlotry that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. What does that mean, with stones and trees? Idolatry. They created their own idols. That's, I, I loved listening to the devotion this morning um, and uh, this, the word that was given. They have eyes they don't see, ears don't hear. There's nothing about these things, these stones or trees, that are going to be able to, to provide for in any way or care for the people, and yet they, the people were bowing down before them. And all that, all that was occurring was a turning away from the true and the living God and then an angering of the Father towards these adulterous people. Verse 8 of the, the psalm this morning that was shared says... Not only have you created these things, but you've become like those things that you've created. And it reminded me, again, I, I had a conversation with somebody who was way off, the, way off the track in doctrine, and I was trying to reel this back into, this is the word, this is who our God is. And she said, not my Jesus. It's like, okay, well, what you've done is you've taken the name of Jesus, and you've applied things that are not his, and you've taken away from him things that are attributes that, and you've created my Jesus. And that is not the Jesus of the Bible. And you've made him to be the way that you want him to be. And how I want God to be um, is, I'm always on the side of the right. You know, that's, I'm always good. No matter where I am, he's going to be I'm going to be right. And, and that's, the, that's the God that I want to step. That makes me always right. And in reality, God doesn't change. He is who he is. He is who he always was, who he is, and who he will always be. He doesn't change regardless of what I want or what I want him to be. He's still the same. And we, as we have looked at uh, recently, we take this position of, I'm the clay and you're the potter. And then we switch it around and say, well, I'm the potter and you're the clay. I'm going to fashion God into the image I want him to be because that, then I'll always be right. And I like to be right. Do you like to be right? 
Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. But we're not always right, especially when it comes to God, because we're always in that place of searching to know Him better and what it is that He wants. And a lot of times, what He wants is nothing like what we were thinking, and, or the timing of it is nothing like what we were hoping, but He gets to do all those things because He's God and we're not. I remember um, hearing something, uh, reading it or whatever, uh, about the difference between cats and dogs. I don't know if you're a cat person. I don't know if you're a dog person. I don't know. But there is a difference. And in looking at it, I, I remember seeing that the dog looks at its owner and says, he is so good to me. He must be God. And the cat looks at the same person and says, he is so good to me, I must be God. <laughs> that's, just, that's just the personality difference between the two. But in reality, God is always God, right? And we are his people, and, and his timing is perfect, and everything that he is is perfect, and we need to remember that. And don't forsake the living water for a broken cistern um, because it will leave us dying and dead. Verse 10, it says, Yet for all this, her treachery, treacherous sister Judah has not returned to me with her whole heart, but in pretense, says the Lord. Then the Lord said to me, Backsliding Israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return backsliding Israel, says the Lord. I will not cause my anger to fall on you, for I am merciful, says the Lord. I will not maintain angry forever. Only acknowledge your iniquity that you have transgressed against the Lord your God and have scattered your charms to alien deities under every green tree. And you have not obeyed my voice, says the Lord. There's a reason that we were in Psalm 51 this morning for our time in communion and for the worship thereafter. It's because God says, this is what I'm after. If, if you return to me, I will forgive. But if your returning to me is just a matter of going back to doing things without your heart coming back to me, don't bother. Because it's a matter of the heart. It's not the matter of uh, rote. You know, I, I remember, again, I remember memorizing uh, prayers when I was little. And the objective, as far as I was concerned, was to say them as fast as you can, because I want to get them done as fast as I can. Did God, was I speaking with the Lord? Was my heart communicating with the heart of the Lord? No. And, and it's his desire that our hearts are there, not just wrote, memorized, whatever. And the Lord is saying to Judah, you know, watch Israel, because there is going to be a repentance there in some of their hearts. God is always reaching. How many people do you think in the United States are love the Lord with all their heart, soul, strength, and mind, love their neighbor as themselves? Not just in what they do, but I mean in their hearts. What's that number? I have no clue. You know who knows? God. He knows the size of the remnant. There's always a remnant. There's always people who love him and are committed to him with their whole hearts. I hope that in this room that we are all in that number. God knows. He knows who, how many are, are there. And God says, if you are in that place, and if you have moved from that place, come back to that place, because that's his desire, that we would be close to him. Not backsliding, not moving backwards. Do you think that backsliding happens like that overnight? No, it's not a, it's not a, fast, it's not a fast procedure. It's very slow. It comes in the form of drifting. You know, we, we drift. And I spoke about this before, having been a body surfer in, in Southern California. You go in the water, and you come out, and especially if you're colorblind, and all the blankets look the same, and it's like, eh, I don't know where I don't know where our beach towel is. I don't I can't I can't recognize anything. It turns out I'm like three lifeguard towers down the beach. I didn't even know I was drifting. 
And that's what backsliding is like. It, you, don't, you don't see it happening. You don't even realize it. I'm just playing in the ocean. And then all of a sudden, I come out, and I'm like, I'm, you know, a lifeguard tower is a block away. I'm three blocks down the beach or more. And I'm walking along going, I, I'm just going to be lucky if I can find. Uh, and I'm looking for the people. Uh, beach towels is not going to happen for me. But I'm looking for the, somebody I recognize. Hopefully somebody's waving at me. You know what the dangerous thing for me? Uh, I almost drowned. Um, I went out into the ocean and, and I'm body surfing. And I started getting pounded by the waves. How many in here have been in the ocean, gone body surfing? Sweet. Bro. <laughs> gone in start getting pounded by waves way bigger than I should have been around. And you start getting tired. And then you start drifting. And it's not a good thing. And my best friend was on the shore, and he's watching me. And, and I'm totally convinced that he's watching me going to heaven. I'm not going to survive this. And I start, I'm like, I hate to do this, but I'm going to have to humble myself and wave. I need help. I'm not, I'm not, I'm going to die here. And fortunately, the drifting took me to a jetty, which goes way out. In, and, and at the jetties, the waves get smaller. It gets a little easier to come in. And as I come in, I go around the jetty. And on the other side, I come in. And here comes the bonehead lifeguard. And I'm like, I'm, I'm already walking. You're a little late on this thing. And he's got the little, like, I'm not even going to grab that because I'm, I'm already walking. And I go to my best friend. I said, why didn't you do something? I was I was drowning. I was going to die there. And he said, oh, I thought you were saying, come on in. The waves are great. <laughs> no, I was not saying that. I was going to die. And I'm drifting, and I'm, I'm going to go under. Because you go under, and you can't come up, and you, you get pounded. And sometimes you don't even know which way is the surface. And it's, like, it's awful. You're going to drown. He did learn from me, though. He didn't go in the water. Drifting is something that happens slowly, and you don't really know. And then you go, how did I get here? How did I get this far away from the Lord? And there were signs that we went around. You know, there were things that God was, he didn't fail to give us the warnings. We just didn't want to listen. We just went, oh, I'll, I'll just go around it. And God's calling out to Israel, and, and he's saying, Judah, you're worse you know what the name Judah means? Praise. They're supposed to be praising the Lord. And they are, have gone to just a, a religious, mechanical thing, and they're not praising him with their hearts at all. They're just doing the duty. In verse 14, he says, Return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, I'm married to you. I will take you one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And I will give you according to my heart, who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. And then it shall come to pass when you are multiplied and increased in the land in those days, says the Lord, that they will say no more, the ark of the covenant of the Lord, it shall not come to mind, nor shall they remember it, nor shall they visit it, nor shall, they, nor shall it be made any more. At that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered to it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. No more shall they follow the dictates of their evil hearts. And in those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel. And they shall come together out of the land of the north and to the land I have given as an inheritance to the fathers. But I said, how can I put you among the children and give you a pleasant land, a beautiful heritage of the house of nations? And I said, you shall call me father and not turn away from me. Surely as a wife treacherously departs from her husband, so have you dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, says the Lord. A voice was heard in the desolate heights, weeping and supplication of the children of Israel, for they have perverted their way. They've forgotten the Lord, their God. He turned you backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Indeed, we do come to you. For you are the Lord our God. Truly in vain 
Our, is our salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of the mountains? Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel, for shame has devoured the labor of our fathers from our youth, their flocks and their herds and their sons and their daughters. We lie down in our shame and our reproach covers us, for we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our fathers from our youth even to this day have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. God gives to them the call to return, come back. Because God's grace is infinitely beyond ours, because his love is infinitely beyond ours, it, it's hard to understand how gracious he is and how loving he is. It, he said, don't, don't try and find the depths of it because you can't. Don't try to find the end of it because there is none. His mercies endure forever, right? His love never fails and never ends. So when we look at what God is saying to these people, he's saying, you know, why, why, what did I do that caused you to turn and then to move away from me and go seeking after these other gods? What did I do? It's not God who did anything. It's people. And we have it within us because we have that sin nature within us. And God says, let me show you the depth of my grace and my love. If you can, you don't have to, but um, in the book of Hosea, have you ever read that book? It's hard reading because the book of Hosea, which is right after the book of Daniel, God gives to that prophet. Now, this is a man of God. He loves the Lord with all his heart, soul, strength, and mind. And God gives him instructions in the first chapter. And he says, I want you to take a wife. And the place that I want you to get your wife from, she is a harlot. She sleeps around like you can't believe. And I want you to take her and make her your wife. Now, that doesn't look like it has a great future in it, does it? But God is giving to the people the illustration through this marriage of what it looks like to be God with his people, his bride, his, his love, his wife. And so Hosea takes this wife, and now her name means completed. It's pronounced Gomer. What comes to mind when you hear the name Gomer? Shazam! Her name's Gomer, and she's a, a prostitute. And, and Hosea makes her his wife in chapter 1. In chapter 2, they start having children together. And each child is a message. Their, their name is a message to the people of Israel. And in chapter 3, she goes back out and returns to the life that she had before she was married. Now, how heartbreaking is that? God is telling these people, this is what it's like to be married to you, O Israel, O Judah. And then God gives to Hosea that, that word, now I want you to go marry her again, bring her back, call her back, make her your wife again. It's like, oh. And that's why he says to the people, how polluted is the land now? Because you've gone out as a harlot. You've, you've, that, this is the, the relationship that you, this is the way you've treated me. What did I do to cause you to go out like that? And yet I'm calling you to return. Come back to me. Enter back in, into that relationship that we once had. Um, you know, for most, and we talked about this um, last time in chapter 2, when we begin the relationship with uh, the one who will become our spouse, what does it look like? I love you. I love you more. I love you more. And somebody finally has to say, just hang up, right? That's not the way this relationship began in, with Hosea and, and his wife. God called him to go out and 
and bring in somebody who he knew was going to be unfaithful. He knew it. He when we get saved, when we give our lives to the Lord, guess what? He knew we were not going to be perfect after we received Jesus as Savior, right? He knew that. I, have you ever asked him, gosh, you know, I make so many mistakes. Why would you save me? And he, Because I love you. That's why he did it. That's why he does it. And he knows that that doesn't mean that from now on, I'm going to be sinless. Lord willing, it means from now on, I'm going to sin less. And, and he is, as it's written in 1 John, he said, you know, when we sin, and if we confess our sin, he, that is God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why? Because we're so good? No, because he is, because he loves us, because he desires for us to be closer to him day by day. And if we find ourselves in that place of backsliding, I, you know, I used to be a lot closer to him. I, it's a tragic thing to talk to somebody and say, well, I used to be, and I used to do, and I used to find myself. It's like, when we moved here, I ran into that a lot. Well, we're kind of in between churches. How long have you been in between churches? About 10 years. It's like, you're not in between churches. <laughs> That's not what's happening here. You need, to, you need to come back to the Lord. You need to get back to that place. Uh, you know, as Jesus talked to the church of Ephesus, he said, you know, return to your first love. Return to that place with God where you're going, I love you. And he says, I love you more. And he does. Amen. Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you, Lord, that your grace uh, is beyond our understanding, that there is no, no place where your grace can't reach because there's no place that your love can't reach. That's why. And we thank you, Lord, that even though you look into our hearts, our minds, our lives, and see those things that still remain or have gotten in there that are doing a work of sending us down the shoreline uh, and uh, we're even losing sight of where uh, we once were. Maybe going down for the third time and, and in peril of life coming to an end here. But you, because of the knowledge that with you, all things are possible, that you can take any life, any people, any nation, and turn it around. But it's a call that you give. We have to respond to that call. We pray, Lord, that by your Holy Spirit, we would respond whenever you speak, whether it's about coming back, stepping forward, stepping in your time, whatever it is that you say, we want to do that. We don't want to step ahead of you or fall behind you. We just want to be where you are. We pray, Lord, for those that may be in that place of backslidden, further away than we once knew. We pray, Lord, that by your Holy Spirit, you would draw us near, that we would become so on fire for you that people would say, you need to put a veil over that face. You are way too shiny because of the time that we spend with you. There is a joy that we have in our hearts, and it is the joy of the Lord. We pray, Lord, that that joy would be that fountain of living water bubbling up and then getting all over everyone around us. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for who we are in you. We thank you and praise you with all that we have. In Jesus' name, Amen. Please stand for one last song.
love your amazing grace. We thank you, Lord, that you are with us always and everywhere and that there's nothing that can separate us from your love. We pray, Lord, that your hand would be upon all those that are here this morning, all those that are watching on the live stream. We pray for the fathers, that they would step up and be the fathers that you desire for them to be in their homes. We pray for their homes, their wives, their, the children there, that this would be a time, a day, and a place where your Holy Spirit would do a work to restore the families as you desire them to be and not what the culture is trying to make them. And we pray, Lord, that by your Holy Spirit, you would use the fathers, the mothers, the children to reach out to those around them and share about your grace, about your mercy, and about your love, that they would come to know you even as we do and rejoice in the love that you have for us. We thank you and we do praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you and the Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you and the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. If you desire prayer, we'll be up here and you can pray with us.